Just a heads up, you won't get plus 200 on the core. Well, we did. The Titan V was actually one of the better overclocking cards we worked with this year. The biggest problem with it, though, is thermals, and then to a lesser extent, although not that much, power. So this is where we're focusing on the power consumption of the card, the thermals of the MOSFETs, the GPU, and the thermal performance of this cooler, which has some slight modifications over the Titan XP, and we're going to look at how much room we have for improvement when moving to our hybrid mod, which is hopefully coming up soon. Before getting to that, this content is brought to you by the Thermaltake Flow RGB closed loop liquid cooler, which is a 360 millimeter radiator plus 3120 fans that are RGB illuminated. The Thermaltake rain fans at that. This is a 4.5 gen Azatec pump, which is one of the faster pumps. You can learn more at the link in the description below. So some quick errata from the teardown video. After posting our teardown video where I basically said the vapor chamber in here is pretty much the same as the Titan XP vapor chamber, sends a couple of small fin differences and uh, differences in how the rear end of the vapor chamber kind of swoops up on the sides. The correction received was that NVIDIA basically changed the fin stack to be copper as well. So it's not just the cold plate of the vapor chamber, it's also the fins. Now, that's not that relevant as you're going to see in a moment, because it's still this cooler on a high wattage card and uh, it's power hungry card. It drives a lot of heat. So it's kind of nebulous how helpful that change is, considering that just moving to a completely different cooler altogether would probably be the better move in terms of peak performance. But Nvidia doesn't tend to want to do that for their Titan class cards, which is potentially some mixture of the audience not caring or maybe they don't have the noise concerns or they put them in rack mount boxes or something. Here's what I want to know. If you're someone who buys this or the Titan XP or any card like that that is potentially targeted at workstation, deep learning, machine learning, let me know below if there's a reason you would like to keep this cooler as opposed to having a better one on there that might be dual axial, for example. Like if you just have two fans blowing down onto it in a traditional open face cooler design. Let me know if there's a, a reason for that. I suppose exhausting heat out of a box, but if you're doing it at the expense of choking your GPU significantly, which we're about to show, then is it really worth it? That's what I want to know. So we're looking at this card, uh, the cooler and the thermal uh, the sort of results that we got for everything. And we're going to start with some clock versus temperature performance it will give us an understanding of how the clock behaves on the Titan V card, including how it down clocks or how it attempts to regulate itself to control temperatures. Prior to diving into thermals, we can start by looking at baseline performance with auto settings and then our overclock, and then we'll look at where the thermal limitations are being encountered. This chart shows frequency over time during an automated run of Firestrike Ultra, Extreme, and Normal, followed by Time Spy. At stock, auto settings, the Titan V is operating a peak clock of about 1770 MHz and gradually diminishes throughout each test pass, which you can see after the gaps where it falls down to an idle rate. If we begin to plot core temperature versus the same benchmark, you'll notice that our peaks to 84 degrees drop clocks almost immediately and what appears to be inversely proportional to temperature rise. Not exactly how it works, but you get the idea. These tests aren't even that long. They're less than a minute each in most cases, and we're still slamming against the 84 degree wall that Pascal and Volta carry. The stock cooler is incapable of keeping up with the power load generated by the card when left to self-regulate. Let's manually impose a 100% fan speed for the next round. So this chart shows the complete stock settings, except with a fan boosted to max speed. This is primarily to understand performance and is not sustainable in any real environment, as noise output for this is at around 60 dBA. Still, looking at frequency, we see that between auto and 100% fan curves with no overclocks at all, the frequency picks up considerably in a few of these tests. We also see differences of up to 100 megahertz and a bit beyond in some instances. That's a lot of performance left on the table just because we're using this bad cooler on the Titan V. These data points illustrate that we are throttling hard on thermals well before we run into power limits, but those are the next limitation. As for how hard that impacts performance, here are the Firestrike Ultra scores for the Auto card, the 100% Fan Speed card, and the Overclocked card. The Stock card pushed a graphic score of 7748 points, while the Stock card with a 100% Fan Speed gave us a couple percent boost, about 2%. 
Our fully overclocked card is well beyond both of these numbers, and part of that is just because we increased the power target as well. So we're running into thermal limits, giving us a 2% reduction, and then running into power limits. Firestrike Extreme has the difference between the stock and 100% speed tests at 2.7% as seen here, and so the scaling changes based upon what test you're doing. This next chart shows our overclock performance. With a 200 megahertz core and HBM overclock, our core now pushes toward two gigahertz at times. This is compared to the previous clocks that were 300 megahertz lower in the worst cases. This performance disparity is from three different factors. We've increased the power budget, eliminating that concern, and have increased the fan speed to 100%, eliminating the thermal concern. We've also manually overclocked the card, and all three of these produce the chart-topping performance numbers that we showed in our previous gaming benchmark video for the Titan V. Looking at thermals, the fan speed increase helps prolong the time window before reaching clock limiters at 84 degrees and beyond. Still, toward the end of the longer test, we were getting up to around 87 degrees, resulting in clock drops over the duration of that test. At 120% power target though, the temperature target changes to 89 degrees if you just allow the slider to match with the power target. Just to demonstrate the previous generation, this chart shows stock Titan XP versus stock Titan V scores. The Titan XP holds a higher clock when both are left to self-regulate, but it's still beaten in most tests by the Titan V. You can learn more about that in our, again, previous Titan V Gaming Benchmarks video. This helps illustrate that the core count increase negatively impacts maximum stock clocks, that's not news to anyone, but is made up for in benchmarks that can actually leverage those cores. TimeSpy is a good example, and one which leverages lower level programming to distribute load more evenly across additional cores to keep more simultaneous in-flight instructions going to all of these shaders. Let's move on to component temperatures. This chart shows the GPU temperature and two MOSFET case temperatures measured by thermocouples that we mounted to various locations on the card. The left side center MOSFET runs warmest at 67.7 degrees, with the right side middle MOSFET at 51.9 degrees Celsius. Both of these values are well within spec. These parts can take 125 degrees plus without issue, or without much of an issue other than derating and some lifespan hit. And this follows the trend of NVIDIA Founders cards typically having more than adequate cooling for VRMs. Despite the somewhat awful cooling for the GPU itself, they do actually do a decent job at keeping the VRMs cooled. Part of this is the selection of the VRMs and the power that the power stages can handle. We've seen this previously on reference 10 series GPUs, and the MOSFET temperatures here are completely controlled. The GPU, however, isn't. We're bumping against 84 degrees frequently, which means clock regulation over time. This frequency chart from our 30-minute Firestrike burn-in shows rapid clock degradation upon hitting the 84-degree wall, where the card's stock configuration automatically regulates its clock speeds. This brings us down from 1837 MHz to 1702 MHz, and is another demonstration of why Titan V could be so much more powerful if they had just put a better cooler on it. This is sort of a repeat, or a broken record, of what we said about Titan XP when we did the hybrid mod on that. We'll be looking into that more shortly. Looking at noise normalized temperatures is almost pointless, as the Titan V just won't be able to compete with AIB partner models of lower end hardware, even though lower end in this instance is a relative reference to the 1080 Ti. Still, if you wanted to keep a 40 decibel operating noise level, the card would throttle down heavily and operate with a GPU core temperature of 90 degrees plus, with MOSFET hotspot temperatures of 71 degrees plus. And that's in open air. With a case, you'd be in worse shape for almost all instances. The MOSFETs are still fully within reason, but the core is throttling us hard. This card runs hot and also loud with its 61 decibel max output at 100%, which is really barely enough to sustain the overclock as we had it configured. With the 40 dBA test, it helps to know our noise levels. The Titan V operates similar noise levels to other NVIDIA reference GPUs. We're measuring about 31 dBA idle, with the average fan speed under auto conditions placing us at around 48 dBA, and going to 100% speed has us at 61. Overall, it's quieter than a reference Vega cooler, but is still ultimately inadequate as a cooling solution. 44% puts us around 40 dBA just for reference to the previous charts. This set of charts will show total system power consumption when under gaming workloads. We'll start with 3 Mark Firestrike. In this test, the Titan V stock card is drawing 350 watts from the wall for the entire system. Comparing this to its neighbors with the same system and power supply, we're at 345 watts on the Titan XP, 381 on the Vega Frontier Edition Air card, and 347 on the stock EVGA 1080 Ti SC2. The overclocked Titan V starts really pulling down power here, 
pushing up to 442 watts total system draw and fire strike. This puts us on par with our power play table modded Vega 56 for the liquid cooler, which consumes 447 watts for the system, though we later pushed that card up to more than 400 watts on its own, measured with a clamp on the 12 volt rails. The difference is that we had a power target of 200% offset on the modded Vega card, and part of this inefficiency on the Titan V likely comes down to Volta not being a gaming targeted architecture with all of these components on the die that go unused when gaming or benchmarking Fire Strike. Moving on to Ghost Recon Wildlands, the Titan V system pulls 388 watts when stock, with a Titan XP at about 375 watts stock. Remember, this is total system power draw, not clamped draw. For a neighbor comparison, the 1080 Ti demonstrates its performance efficiency at 370 watts for the EVGA SC2, and overclocking our Titan V without any mods to it at all gets it to around 420 watts, right around where our overclocked Titan XP landed. The power modded Vega 56 card is the most power hungry here at 476 watts for the system as compared to its stock 332 watt total system consumption. The Titan V overclocked system is pulling 8.3% more power than the stock card. Idle power consumption has our complete system at around 80 watts with the card just drawing enough power for the fan and some signaling that's pushing less than a couple of watts through the 12 volt rails going into the PCIe connectors. So the takeaway here is a repeat of what we said about the Titan XP takeaway. Basically, ignoring the card's actual performance capabilities, and they were impressive in some instances, specifically asynchronous compute workloads, DirectX 12, Vulkan low-level APIs, ignoring those and looking just at the thermals, it's severely limited with the current cooler. So it's possible that a company like EVGA could put out some kind of aftermarket hybrid solution, for example, which would solve those problems. You'd have to buy it and assemble it yourself, though, because NVIDIA is the only supplier for this card. So there will be no AIB partner models unless you're buying aftermarket coolers and adding them. And if you're interested in that, let them know because they're probably not gonna make it without significant interest, any of these companies, because it's a $3,000 card. And how many people buy that and then mod it is the question. We're gonna be one of those groups of people though. We are modding it, hopefully, to be a hybrid card, which means we're gonna add a liquid cooler to it. Now the big challenge here is that the mounting hole spacing is different from what we're used to. I don't think it's even the same mounting hole spacing as the Vega Frontier Edition card. And so we're gonna have to get out a drill and make a plate ourselves to solve that problem. You also have issues where the HPM is very fragile. And so with the raw mounting pressure, it's pretty easy to crack those dies. You have to start with just enough pressure to get contact and make them stop moving around on the plate and then go from there. But the cooler itself stock is not impressive. It's actually pretty bad. <laughs> These blower coolers, including the one that it's on top of, they're all pretty bad compared to anything that you'd want for actual performance out of the card because it's dropping clocks. It's like 100 megahertz off the top, just out of the box, basically. It's got all this performance on the table. You don't even have to overclock to get it. You don't need to go into precision and set a 200 megahertz offset. It's just not necessary to get that extra speed because the core the GPU itself, under Boost 3.0, has the capability to push up to a limit. There are three limits with Boost 3.0. There's power, which we're not hitting. There's voltage, which we're not hitting. And there's thermals, which we are hitting at 84 degrees. So with a better cooler, just let's just play pretend and say there's a water cooler on here out of the box. You put it in the system, it's going to run about 100 to 170 megahertz faster, depending on what kind of scenario you're in with the stock card, how bad your case is, how bad your room ambient temperature is, all that stuff. That's a lot of performance you can get back for basically nothing. And then once you go beyond that, it gets to overclocking. And overclocking this card, it's actually going to the positives for a second. It's a very good overclocker. We were pretty impressed with it. And after some mods, uh, shunt mods or liquid cooling mods, we expect it'll do a whole lot better. But with a better cooler on there to start, man, it'd be it'd just be a lot more impressive of a card because just in the gaming results alone, ignoring anything that it's built for in the compute world, the gaming results alone with these bigger overclocks on the stock cooler, we were seeing gains that were sometimes 20, 22% higher than the stock card, which is kind of insane in a good way. So it's got a whole lot of room here. It's really easy to push the card pretty far, 200 megahertz core and HBM, uh, and it's just being choked by this cooler, which is unfortunate. And it comes back to the question at the beginning of the video. When do you want 
this cooler as a legitimate user of this card because I can think of a few core reasons for cards that aren't this, like let's say the 10 series. The 10 series, you might want a cooler like this or a Vega 56 cooler if you are an SI and you want something that you can roll out easily, uh, repair and service easily, and you know will work in poorly maintained environments, which would be most SI customers probably. Uh, that would be one reason. Another reason would be if you're using a small box and you need to exhaust heat out of the entire box, like if you have a radiator that's front mounted and pulling in hot air, you need to get that out of the case. You can suck it through the video card. Video card's not gonna be happy with you, but it'd be a great way to get air out of the case that's already been warmed. So those are some legitimate reasons. Do either of those or does the latter one apply to an actual user of this card though is what I want to know. And I don't know that we'll get many answers because I, I would doubt that many people are buying one of these. Uh, but if you were a Titan XP purchaser, the same question applies to you. As enthusiasts though, and this card isn't really meant for you either, but as enthusiasts looking at this type of cooler in general, it, yeah, they tend to be pretty disappointing. Fortunately, there are aftermarket mods we can do. It's just gonna take some work. And we'll have a video series on that. So subscribe for that as always. You can go to store.gamersnexus.net slash modmat to pre-order our brand new mod mat that we've been working on developing. Or you can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out for smaller contributions. Subscribe for more. Thank you for watching. I'll see you all next time.